I'm sure there are some people who are wondering what is this guy gargantuan goy doing up here at this Chabad occasion. And you really saw a part of the chain of causation right before you. Look, I showed up in Oxford not expecting to experience one of the most soul-enriching uh, 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 associations I've ever had, and that is with Chabad. Uh, the person who first introduced me to Chabad was mentioned earlier, Rabbi Shmuley Bolteach. If it was not for him, you can applaud, definitely. If it was not for him, it was actually his wife, frankly. He gets too much credit. It was his wife that showed the generosity of spirit of Abraham, who was said to have kept his tent open on four sides so that anyone who approached would feel, uh, feel welcome and meet, feel their hospitality. Uh, it is that was what I experienced at Oxford and joined a Shabbat table with regularity around the L'Chaim Society and met people like David Slager, met people like my dear friend Abe Eisenstadt. But there's something about applause down here. But there's something about Chabad, I've now realized this, that you can't go anywhere on the globe without one Chabad rabbi passing you off to another Chabad rabbi. And, and it's this powerful network. So as I began to go back home, I'm leaving England, this wonderful Jewish experience I've had, Shmuley says, I may not have been successful in being your Shachan, but I will fix you up with somebody who will be just as powerful in your life. And he passed me off to another Chabad rabbi, and that was Shmuley Hecht. Now, Shmuley Hecht was my co-conspirator at Yale. The two of us together, uh, we tricked a lot of people. All these Jews who had never lit, sh lit Shabbat candles, all these Jews who weren't that observant, he would send me in to get them. And, and, and they're like, this black guy, what's he about? I'm like, come have dinner with me. Okay, fine. And then we got him in the room, and next thing they know, they were having Shabbos. It was a brilliant plan, people. <laughs> Five guys around a Shabbat table has turned into the, one of the largest Jewish groups and organizations, most influential in all the Ivy League. And I'm pleased, and lo and behold, I had a wonderful experience. I'm leaving. I'm going, now I'm going back home, going to Jersey, going to Newark. And, and, and Rabbi Hecht says, no, before you go, I, I got to connect you to the next Lubavitch rabbi. And I'm like, come on, haven't I done my time? Haven't I given enough? And next thing he knows, he takes me down, literally takes me to Newark, and sits me down with a Lubavitcher in Newark, an amazing man who was in the mayor's office today. I wasn't there. He was there making decisions for me. Or at least he left a Tanakh on my desk as a gift. And that was Rabbi Block. Rabbi Block, are you here? Yes, Rabbi Block, I'm sure, is here as well. So here I have, for the last 20 years of my life, been a part of this powerful Lubavitch chain of causation. And if there's anything that I've benefited from, doing regular Torah study with my dear friends, having the opportunity to sit at Shabbat tables on a regular basis. It is the fact that these friends in my lives have helped me struggle with some of the core issues of humanity. And here we are today, gathered here, for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. Rabbi Hecht asked this question about Rabbi Akiva, who has asked that question, it's these ideas almost uh, relating to that Socratic method of asking questions. Why is there suffering? Why would God allow that? Rabbi Akiva said to the evil governor, if you had a child and the king imprisoned that child, wouldn't you be happy if you knew someone fought to sneak that child food? And he said, well, we are the children of God, he told the governor. And God is pleased if his own children fight to find justice. It is these questions that provoke the ideas and the ideals of humanity. When I was a young man in Newark and, and was beginning my organizing there, I met a woman who is tenant president of the buildings in which we live, and I found out as I was talking to her one time that her child, who served in the American military, came home and was murdered in the lobbies of her building. And I asked a question, a question. I said, Miss Jones, you have to walk through this lobby where your son was murdered every day. You and I, and I knew she and I paid market rent to live in these public housing projects. I said, how could you still live here and walk through these projects? And she was almost insulted by the question, the question. She said, how could I still live here 
and walk through the lobby where my child was slain every day? And I said, yes. She goes, how could I still live in apartment 5A since 1969? I said, yes. She goes, how could I still be the tenant president of these buildings since they were built? I said, yes. And she said proudly as she stuck out her chest, she says, because I'm in charge of Homeland Security. She was taking responsibility. She was not accepting the world as it is. The questions that we ask. Hillel said, if I am only for myself, then who will be for me? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, then what am I? I so love that, what Hillel said, because it wasn't who am I, it is what am I? These are the questions. The truth of Judaism, as I've learned from my study with many a Chabad rabbi, is not to accept the world as it is. That is not why we were created, but to demand that the world be more just and truthful. It is one of the highest callings of humanity to stand with courage and do justice. Isn't it not what Micah asked? Oh, what, O oh Lord, do your, you want from your people? To love kindness to walk humbly with your God, and to do justice. I found it curious to me that, that in the one discussion I had about the Torah, about why would Abraham argue God? What religion celebrates the audacity of a man to stand there and argue with God in front of Sodom and Gomorrah? It was almost as if this non-acceptance of injustice is a celebrated quality. And that question, won't the God of mercy show mercy? You talk about Moses standing before God when God sees the people worshiping a, a golden calf and simply saying, we'll destroy these people and give you some more people to lead. And Moses says, no. He says in Hebrew, ma cheni na mi sifreka. If you destroy these people, then erase me from your book. This is the Jewish way. This is the way of justice. And it is not just about doing justice for others, giving charity when in times of comfort and convenience. The Torah celebrates people that in their time of pain, in their time of discomfort and agony, they still manifest those ideals. Was it not Abraham, after being circumcised, sitting in pain, that four strangers come to him? And he gets up in his pain and he offers them kindness. He offers them food. And it is only then that they reveal themselves to be angels and bestow upon him a blessing. Is it not Daniel who showed faith in the lion's den? Is it not David who showed courage in front of Goliath? Is it not the story that we have just finished in the Parsha of last week of Joseph who in early in his life all his dreams were selfish about himself and how he would lord over his brothers and his family? Is it not until that he ha started having dreams of helping other people in prison at that time showing that compassion and that love that his fortunes changed? In Newark, I see this kind of greatness. I see this kind of justice. There's a man I know who came out of a diner and was attacked by a gunman. The gunman shot and murdered his friend and then shot him three times in the shoulder, in the side, in the side of his face. And he put his head down and charged the guy, tackled him, forcing him to the ground, holding him with all his might as he bled the sidewalk red. The police came and told him he could let go now. He was in the hospital. I visited him in the bed. His body was broken, but his spirit was not. Months later, recovered from his wounds, I get a call from my staff saying, you'll never believe what that young man's doing. He's joining the Newark Police Academy because he believes he's not going to wait for someone else to bring justice to our streets. This is the spirit that is exalted in the Torah. This is the spirit that brings us together today. We have challenges around our globe. We have pain and agony that is going on. There is suffering in this world. 
But the greatest calling we have is no matter what our circumstance, to manifest tzedakah, manifest chesed, goodness, kindness, and charity. Now we all who sit here today drink deeply from wells of freedom and liberty that we did not dig. We eat lavishly from banquet tables that were prepared for us by our ancestors. We eat fruit from trees that were tilled and watered with the tears and blood of those who came before. We have a calling. Life is not a spectator sport where we could luxuriate in that which we have. We must get involved and on the field in making a difference. I am in awe as I stand here of what Chabad has done. I am in awe of this organization. There is a calling to every generation that they do something more than their parents did, that they show that level of courage and advance the ideals of humanity farther. I want to end with a simple story from history that reminds us of this truth. It is about an extraordinary man that is not celebrated as much in our history, but his name was Israel. His name was Israel Putman. He was one of the first great generals of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. He was the man that was there during the Battle of Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill was taking incredible assaults, but Israel Putman kept his men strong and inflicted terrible damage on the enemy. He did not give up, fought time and time again with a ferocity and a determination to liberate his people from injustice and tyranny. Eventually, as you all know, in this first great battle of the Revolutionary War, the hill was taken. But the British wrote back home and said, we have won the battle, but a few more victories like this and we will lose the war. Decades later, that was in the late 1700s, years passed, 1788 passed, you all know that year, I hope, the year that this organization was founded. A little later than that, in 1825, a man named Daniel Webster stood up to put a monument to Israel Putman and the others who fought on that hill. He said very profoundly in his speech, and let the sacred obligation which have devolved on this generation and on us sink deep into our hearts. The great trust now descends to new hands. We can win no laurels in a war for independence. Earlier and worthier hands have gathered them all. Our fathers have fulfilled them. But there remains to us the great duty of defense and preservation. Let our age be the age of improvement. Let us do something that is worthy of being remembered. Let us cultivate true spirit of harmony. Let us call forth powers and build institutions that promote all of our greatness. This was his calling, and it's our calling as well. What will we do to be remembered? What contributions will we make? What institutions will we build? Kolel Chabad is showing that we can build institutions worthy of the struggles that have come before us. They are showing us that we can fulfill the call of Elijah to do such good that it can be a light unto nations. It is showing the truth of what Martin Luther King said, that the challenge today is not the violent words and the vitriolic opposition of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. This organization, through its resounding strength and spirit, is smashing the dam of indifference and allowing the waters to roll down like mighty streams of justice. I stand here in humble gratitude for what you all are doing, but we must continue. Today marks progress. Today marks success. But the mission is not accomplished. There is work to do. There is love to create. There is a world to heal. 
may we continue in the progress. Thank you.